It was one of those things no one ever doubted. The first people on this continent were the Indians, period. No reason to believe otherwise. But two summers ago in the town of Kennewick, Washington, a skeleton turned up that could turn out to be the missing link between what we thought to be the truth and what actually is the truth. A truth, if it is the truth, that the Indians are not happy with. July 1996, two college students wading through shallow waters near the edge of the Columbia River literally stumbled on a human skull. The county coroner, thinking he might have a recent murder on his hands, called in Jim Chatters, a local forensic archaeologist, to investigate. The whole skeleton was scattered on the beach, just strewn in the mud of the reservoir. When Chatters assembled the bones of an adult male on his office lab table, he knew right away this was not a recent case. Who did you think he was at first, when you first examined him? It looked like he was probably a white settler, a European settler. European settler what, in the 19th century? Late 19th, early 20th century, right. But that didn't make sense when Chatters then discovered what looked like a prehistoric stone spear point embedded in the skeleton's hip. So he sent a tiny piece of bone off for radiocarbon dating and got back the news of a lifetime. The skeleton on his lab table was over 9,000 years old, one of the oldest intact skeletons ever found in North America a scientific treasure. And I just kind of let out a hoop and just, I don't believe this. That. Chatters got just to the like point where he was down almost down. communing with Kennewick Man, who he thinks may have looked like the actor Patrick Stewart. Was he handsome? In the sense that handsome people are those with a high degree of facial symmetry, yes. Kennewick Man was coming to life before Chatters' eyes. He wanted to learn more, but he had a problem. We regard human remains as sacred, period. Armand Minthorn is a religious leader of the Umatilla Indian tribe. The Umatillas, together with four other local tribes, said that any man who lived along the Columbia River 9,000 years ago had to be their ancestor. They demanded the right to bury him immediately. Our older people tell us that when a body goes into the ground, that's where it's re to remain until the end of time. Specifically, a federal law passed in 1990 that gave Native Americans the right to the remains of their ancestors. But that's where things got dicey, because based on his preliminary research, Jim Chatter speculated that Kennewick Man was probably not an ancestor of the American Indians, which would mean the Indians may not have been the first people in North America. He showed us a cast of an Indian skull here on the right, and compared it to a cast he made of Kennewick Man's skull. See the angularity here? Uh -huh. the, the angle that it forms? Right. Uh, that's a very typical American Indian. It's a very round head as opposed to a long, narrow head. He just jumps out at you. You could put this one in a crowd of, of Native American skulls. I mean, you could put him in with a hundred of them and you'd still pick him right out of the crowd. As modern studies have shown, Craniofacial measurements are not as reliable as once thought to predict ancestral relations between populations because craniofacial plasticity is subject to change by the forces of the environment. Frank Boas, one of the pioneers of anthropology, as we know it today, stated as early as 1916 that craniofacial measurements could vary from one generation to the next in studies of immigrants and their children. Racialists of course scoffed at this idea. But modern studies like that of Dr. Gravely, in 2003, have vindicated his claims. This is a first glance, so I don't have a sense of time on him. All I have is just his physical features to work with. Very long, narrow brain case. Very distinct brow. And a nose that just jumps off his face. Very pronounced nose. These are all characteristics more often see on Western Eurasian skeletons. Dr. Chatters, who was a little-known anthropologist of no marked repute became famous overnight because of his foolish claims of Kennewick Man. Of course, to Chatters, a face like that of known Native American activist and actor, Wes Studi, must be European because he has a long narrow skull shape and his nose just jumps off his face. If we want to buy into all these craniometric claims, then we should consider the fact that Kennewick Man is one lone individual, not a statistical sampling of various individuals. So finding which population average might be closest is irrelevant.
we can look at Howell's database and find which individuals are closest in proportions to Kanawek men overall. The closest cranial comparison is not Ainu, Norse, or any other old world skull, it is a 27-year-old Eskimo skull. So much for the craniometric claim that Kanawek man was European. The fact of the matter is that all ancient North American skulls fall within the Native American range overall, and even the more extreme variations are still explainable as plesiomorphic features that evolved into the present Native Americans. More importantly, all have been found on the western USA and Mexico, not the East Coast. Nearly two decades after the ancient skeleton called Kennewick Man was discovered on the banks of the Columbia River, the mystery of its origins appears to be nearing resolution. Genetic analysis, a preliminary results, point to Native American heritage. The researchers performing the DNA analysis feel that Kennewick has normal standard Native American genetics, according to a 2013 email to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineer, which is responsible for the care and management of the bones. At present, there is no indication he has a different origin than North American, Native American. DNA samples from human remains that predate 1492 are referred to as ancient DNA. Because of the way that science has been improved, now it's gotten to where you can actually analyze the DNA of skeletons that are, you know, a thousand years old. Dr. Dennis O'Rourke of the University of Utah is one of the leading researchers in the field of ancient DNA. Our work on ancient DNA is fairly straightforward. Uh, first, we identify um, prehistoric populations where skeletal material uh, has been um, discovered. We take fairly small skeletal samples, usually uh, a fragment of a rib, and it's a simple chemical process to uh, release the nucleic acids or the DNA that is contained within that bony matrix uh, at the time of uh, initial European contact and subsequently uh, all of our ancient samples predate that contact so there's no evidence of admixture uh, in our ancient samples. When they test DNA isolated from uh, the remains of Native Americans um, they always find Asian lineages amongst those remains. The story of the first Americans and the story of the ancient white migrations. <laughs> what you are looking at is the oldest skull ever found in both North and South America. This skull was originally discovered on the outskirts of what is today in Mexico City, Mexico. The most intriguing aspect of the skull is that it is long and narrow and typically Caucasian in appearance, like the heads of white. Western Europeans today. That is a direct quote from an article by a journalist, not an anthropologist, named Steve Connor who wrote that article in 2002. What the makers of the first Americans video failed to quote from that article was the words of one of the most prestigious physical anthropologists of our time, Professor Chris Stringer, the head of human origins at the Natural History Museum in London. Quote, I personally haven't found the solitary and pinyon connection claims very convincing. For a start, there are lots of examples in archaeology where various artifacts from different parts of the world can end up looking similar even though they have different origins. Most humans in the world at that time were long-headed and it doesn't surprise me that Penyon woman, at 13,000 years old, is also long-headed. End quote. In other words, the trend in all humans, the ancestors of Asians, Europeans, Africans, and Native Americans, during that time period was to be long-headed, dolichocephalic. The ancient skulls found in the Americas were not some imaginary Caucasoid population. They were archaic Native Americans, ancestors of today's Native Americans. The mongoloid look, seen in some, not all, Native Americans and Asians, doesn't even appear in Asia or the Americas until around 9,000 years ago. Racialists must believe they were leprechauns who just magically appeared out of nowhere. Of course. If racialists paid attention to the news they would have known that in May of 2003, Dr. Sylvia Gonzalez, of Britain's Liverpool John Moores University, announced that her DNA study of Penyon woman confirmed she had an Asian origin, just like modern Native Americans. Of course, craniometric studies such as that of Dr. Gonzalez Jose, in 2006, matched up Penyon woman with the modern Piracu, from Baja, California. 
A study of the Pericu DNA in 2006 by Dr. Gonzalez showed that they had typical Native American mitochondrial DNA. Penyon woman, one of the oldest skulls found in the Americas, was an ancestor of today's Native Americans. What is most significant about the genetic research is that it validates what we already knew from other scientific disciplines. From biological anthropology more generally, we knew a long time ago that American Indians resembled Asians, and particularly the people from the regions around Mongolia and, and Siberia. Uh, archaeologically, we knew that there was similarity between the cultures of Northeast Asia and those of the early Americans, that is in the types of, of uh, artifacts they used and left behind. We also knew, based upon linguistic evidence, that American Indians shared a common ancestry with at least some of the Northeast Asians and the Siberians. So we had all of this other evidence from scientific disciplines as diverse as linguistics and archaeology and human biology, all showing us an Asian origin of American Indians. Now the genetic data confirms what we already knew from that other material. Yes, the genetic data is certainly in agreement with other kinds of biological information as well as archaeology and linguistics in placing the origin, the ultimate geographic origins of the native populations of the Americas in Asia. There is a, a comprehensive, widespread consensus among anthropologists today from all subdisciplines of anthropology that the homeland of Native Americans is East Asia. There is a scientific consensus that the original peoples that came to the Americas uh, came from Asia. Now DNA fingerprinting is analogous to fingerprinting leaving your fingerprints. It's, it's a very um, uh, hard science, really, when it comes down to it. It's been able to really answer very clearly what's happened. And that is, is that, that the American Indian is, at least their DNA, comes from Asia. Finally, it appears um, that there may have been even a European ancient migration into the Americas. And the way we found that is we were studying a Native American tribe up in this area of Central North America. And there we found a particular mitochondrial DNA lineage which looked like a European lineage over here which we had defined as lineage X. So it was only found in Europe. It's never found in Asia. But in fact, when we looked at this population of Native Americans, we found that fully 25% of all of the people in this area had X. Now, you could argue, oh well, X is just because it, since Columbus, some women came over from Europe, happened to marry with these Native Americans, and that's why European X is there. However, again, we use the molecular clock to find out when that X came. We compared the sequence of X from Europe with X from the, uh, this population, and they came together 15,000 years ago. So therefore, this did not come to this region since Columbus. It came after one of the most recent glacial maxima. And so it's been proposed um, that, in fact, when the ice covered the area between Newfoundland, Greenland, uh, Iceland, and Europe, that, in fact, some hunters actually crossed the ice sheet and colonized this part of the Americas. And uh, Dennis Swafford of the Smithsonian has even speculated that it was this migration from Europe, from the um, Iberian Peninsula, that brought the unique stone culture that we know as the Clovis culture. That is the culture that's been associated with the killing of the woolly mammoths and the other large animals. And that is just the time that the Clovis culture appears in North America. And the appearance of the Clovis culture, in fact, heralded the decimation of all the large mammalian fauna. Dr. Joe Lorenz of the Coriel Institute in Camden, New Jersey, is performing brand new analysis of the brain DNA, using techniques no one had access to back in the 1980s. 
Lorenz is re-examining sections of DNA called haplogroups in the brains of five Windover people. He's looking for haplogroups found only in native North Americans because finding them would corroborate all previous work. In contrast to all previous findings, Lorenz couldn't confirm the Windover people were Americans. Further investigation revealed something even more remarkable. I went back to the screen and I looked at the sequences again. The first person's DNA, it looked European. When I looked at the second one, it looked European. When I looked at the third, fourth, and fifth, they were slightly different from the first two, but they looked European. Lorenz had found DNA unlike any other from Native Americans. Most scientists believe that some 15,000 years ago, people walked from Asia across the landmass now covered by the Bering Straits into North America. Lorenz's results could be consistent with a new and controversial theory that proposes some of the earliest people migrated to America from Europe, perhaps by crossing an Atlantic Ocean significantly narrower than it is today. If our genetic analysis shows that these individuals really do belong to a new and previously unidentified lineage, founding lineage in the new world, it would be very big news. So the race is on to find the final proof. But for the moment, Lorenz's work has added to the mounting evidence of an early European migration. Revolutionary findings now show that some American Indians have mitochondrial DNA markers which are also only found in Europe, showing prior mixing with Europeans between 12,000 and 36,000 years ago. I think I will let Professor Murphy, Chair of the Department of Anthropology at EDCC, do the basic explanation as to why haplotype X in Native Americans is not an indication of a European presence. The connections that exist, such as that of haplogroup X, are from about 25,000 years ago. What you should show, if, if American Indians came from the Europeans, what we should show is that the same haplogroups that we find in the Americas are the same haplogroups that exist in the Europeans. But A, B, C, and D, the four main haplogroups that account for 98% of American Indians are not found in Europeans. Okay, only one of those X is found there and that one's far too old. Jeff Lindsay argues that the X haplogroup might be evidence of a connection uh, with American Indians. Uh, he's made that argument despite the evidence that now clearly shows that the X haplogroup is found in Siberia. Or his argument requires that, in a sense, this one haplogroup that happens to have uh, a few similarities with Siberians and American Indians and the Europeans, that that itself is evidence. The problem with his scenario is that you can actually break down the haplogroup X into different categories, okay, different haplotypes. Okay? And these haplotypes, in a sense, tell us a history of haplogroup X. The haplogroup X that is found in the Europeans is of a different strand than that found in American Indians. That's how we come up with the date of 25,000 years ago, or because of those differences. The Siberian haplotypes of haplogroup X are in between those of American Indians and those of Europeans, when it should be the other way around. If the American Indians came from the Europeans, then it should be the European haplotypes that are more similar to the American Indians, not the Siberian ones. Siberian haplotypes of haplogroup X are between American Indians and Europeans, so that it shows that they had to have come from Siberia, not from the Europeans. Furthermore, in Kivisold's groundbreaking study of haplogroup X, they stated clearly in 2003 that when they surveyed all populations, the only one with one of the five mutations that characterized haplogroup X2A, the Native American haplotype was one instance in Iran. Nowhere near Europe. Here are some images of Altaian and Evang peoples. Hardly European look. But where else is this DNA found? And where did it originate? The 
form of haplogroup X that's present in the Americas is known as haplogroup X2A. And this specific type is defined by a number of additional mutations that Native Americans who belong to haplogroup X share. Um, this particular form of haplogroup X is not found in Europe. Um, but in particular, there is no con there's no recent connection to Europe and to European individuals who possess haplogroup X. Um, the only similarities that we see are similarities that stem from much more distant, much more ancient ancestry um, that probably dates back 30,000, 40,000 years, perhaps somewhere in the Near East. And so what most likely happened is that this very ancient common ancestor of individuals who belonged to haplogroup X had descendants who split and went two different directions. Probably some of these individuals moved to Europe, others moved towards Asia and up towards Beringia. And it appears that this Asian form of haplogroup X is what eventually made its way into the Americas. There have been some recent studies that have suggested that this particular distribution of haplogroup X in the Americas is most consistent with a migration from Asia through the Bering Strait over the land bridge and then down through the ice-free corridor. And so if individuals with haplogroup X migrated through that ice-free corridor, they would have first entered the continental United States and continental North America in the upper Great Plains. And it would make sense then that we would see the highest frequency of haplogroup X today in populations in that region.